Is there a truly national Canadian voice, first articulated 150 years ago by our founding father, Sir Johnny Macdonald? Are we more like a collection of provinces doing their own thing in a single state? Or maybe something in between? That classic Canadian debate has been going on for a long time, and now author John Boyko has joined it with his latest book. It's called Sir John's Echo, The Voice for a Stronger Canada. And John Boyko joins us now for more. Always great to have you here at TVO. Thank you very much. Appreciate your visits. Back. You seem to be pumping out books every year now. So. Well, I work hard. <laughs> <laughs> you keep writing and we'll keep having you back. You. Let's quote from the book right off the top here. Mr. Director, if you would. McDonald's acumen was in first recognizing, as he could well do, given the astonishing carnage of the American Civil War, that the U.S. Constitution was too generous in its bestowal of powers to the states. Canada would reverse the American error. Talk to us about that off the top. What did you see as the American error? What did Sir John see as the American error that needed correcting north of the border? Well, what a lot of Canadians um, are coming to understand more with all of our 150 celebrations and more looking at our history and our founding is that we were born at a time when the Americans were butchering themselves in civil war, a, a terrible war. 700,000 Americans would die in that war. And the South was fighting for states' rights. Now, the power that they wanted their states to have was the power to maintain slavery. But the, the point that they were making was it is all about the states having the power that they need to control the economy, to control other things that were necessary in order for them to keep slavery. That was the essence of the American Constitution. What Sir John and the other founders said was that we are going to create our own state. Here in the smoke of the American Civil War, we are going to create ourselves in order to save ourselves. We're going to bring from Britain the best that Britain had to offer. We're going to have parliamentary democracy. We're going to have a House of Commons. We didn't have any lords, so we're going to have a, a Senate. And we are going to have the monarchy maintained. But from the Americans, we're going to bring a written constitution and we're going to have a federal system. And that's where it begins. We're going to have a federal system that the Americans had so that the, the central government, what we call the federal government, could have a certain degree of power, and the state governments, we call them provinces, provincial governments, could have a certain degree of power. But this is where Sir John, both in the meetings that were held in Charlottetown and in Quebec City, and then again in London, and in all of the ratification votes that were taking place after those meetings, said, we are going to do what the Americans did really well, a written constitution, we are going to fix what they did very, very poorly and what caused their civil war. He took the South at their word and said their war was caused by the states being given too much power. We are going to turn that on its head and we are going to give dominant power to the central government and we are going to ensure that the provincial governments are little more than glorified municipalities. So that was his vision for a Canada that would work better, obviously, and avoid the carnage of the American Civil War. What did the provinces of the day, who are, of course, partners in this confederation, mm -hmm. what did they have to say about that vision? Well, the vision that came um, from Charlottetown was that we needed the federal system, especially the, the people of Quebec, represented by Carchet and New Brunswick, that we need that federal system, that we need, the provinces need to maintain the powers that they had, especially with respect to education, so that they could maintain their uniqueness. Once they had that, they were fully satisfied with the amount of power that, were, that was given to, to each of them. And the ratification votes that took place in each of the colonies at that point of British North America supported that concept. I don't have to tell you that over time, over the ensuing decades, that pendulum started to swing. And, uh, well, let's go to the 1940s when Maurice Duplessis, the Premier of Quebec, and then uh, Mitch Hepburn, the Premier of Ontario, pointed out many years later that Confederation was nothing more than a treaty between the provinces. That meant the federal government was a child of the provinces and, like all children, should be quiet and obedient. So say you, quoting them back in the day. Do you see yes. any legitimacy in that view? No. The provinces were not in existence before the federal government. There were simply colonies. 
So it is unlike in the, in the United States where the states very much did create the federal government. Um, there, there were no states. There were simply colonies. And what we had was... Well, let me just hang on. There, yes. There was an Ontario. There was a Quebec. I mean, Ontario was called something else. Canada. There was a t Ontario. There was a Quebec. There was a New Brunswick. There was a Nova Scotia. These were the four founding colonies of yes. our country. Yes, they were. And they came together in order, to, in order that a, a new structure could be created. And they absolutely agreed with that new structure. And you are right that it has changed since then, but it didn't take until the 1940s. The fireworks over Ottawa that were celebrating the Confederation in July 1867, I think had barely cooled before provinces began to say, we need more power and we deserve more power. And that began essentially with Ontario and Oliver Mowat, who was one of our longest serving, I think We're gonna our longest serving, yes. and he was the one that began it. Now, by the 1940s, the pendulum had indeed swung. And what we began to see was a new relationship, um, certainly in place before the 1940s, but this, the, the war certainly changed it. Back in the day, and let, let's find out just how far you would push this national vision of Sir John A's, the echo of which you have written about so well in the book, Back in the day, Sir John A. and successive federal governments had the right to disallow mm -hmm. provincial laws that they found inconsistent with that national vision you have described. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go back to that day, do you? No. And something that the book is trying to say, I think, is that the dominant power should, like Sir John envisioned, be with Ottawa. And the Ottawa government needs the power and the capacity that the Constitution gives them, that Sir John A. and the other founders give them, in order that we might build the country through either public works or public policies and save the country in times of emergencies. We need that power. We need there to be one voice speaking for Canada, not 13, and that voice needs to stay with the federal government. But I argue also in the book that that does not mean that premiers are not patriots, because absolutely they are, and it doesn't mean that provinces are not important, because absolutely they are. So what we are talking about is a matter of degrees, and what you were mentioning about in the 1940s, and certainly before and since, is the provinces trying to change that balance to get more power for themselves, the federal government trying to remain true to Sir John's vision and maintain the balance where it should be. And that push me pull you is sort of the great Canadian story over the last 150 years. Exactly. You, you mentioned Oliver Mowat, and I do want to pick up on that. He is our, in Ontario, longest serving premier ever. 24 mm -hmm. years, I think, an astonishing record that will never be broken. Mm -hmm. He fought Macdonald every step of the way. When Macdonald wanted a stronger federal government, Mowat pushed back and said, no, we need our powers here in Ontario as well. When the feds tried to meddle into Ontario's business, Mowat constantly pushed back. Are you here to say that Mowat was wrong? I'm here to say that Mowat was doing what he believed was absolutely right for the province of Ontario. And every premier is fighting to do what is absolutely right for their province. And Sir John and... Um, many, many other prime ministers um, said that that is exactly what their job is. But the prime minister's job is to do what is best for all of Canada, not simply one. And that is the conversation, the fight, if you will, but I'd like to call it a conversation <laughs> between the premiers and the federal government that has been going on for 150 years. That is the conversation that makes us, I don't think, weaker, but stronger. Again, then, circling back to the American example and comparison, What's not listed in the American Constitution, those residual powers all go to the states. Yes. In Canada, we have the opposite. It goes to the feds. Still the right approach today? I believe so. And I believe so because we don't know what is coming in the future. Sir John couldn't say in 1867 the federal government should be in charge of regulating the internet mm -hmm. or regulating airports. And we don't know what is coming uh, 50 years down the road, but we do know there will be more technological advances and other things that will be happening. And the federal government needs to have the power and capacity to deal with whatever issues are coming up for the best um, efforts of all Canadians, not just what would benefit one particular province. Can I, can I, let's really understand this. Are you saying that Canada would never have had a CBC, Air Canada, RCMP, uh, unemployment insurance, none of these things would have happened had we not had the very strong federal government that echoes Sir John A's vision? 
everything that you've just said it was part of the vision of a federal prime minister, a federal cabinet, a federal government. And the federal government had the power to bring those things about. In almost every case that you mentioned and many others that we could discuss, the premiers were fighting against the implementation of those policies. And it was the determination of federal politicians that made those po possible. Now, of course, now last, where are we going back to now? 1990, I guess, with Meech Lake and then 1992 with the Charlottetown effort, mm -hmm. both undertaken by former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Mm -hmm. Those were, I guess, writ large, efforts to rebalance that conversation that you have referred to. Who yes. does what? Who gets what powers? In essence, in your view, what were those constitutional negotiations about? Well, what most Mr. Mulroney came to office believing that Mr. Trudeau had erred. In 1982, when, when Mr. Trudeau um, brought our Constitution home and we finally won a constitutional maturity, if you will, and the, that final independent step from Great Britain, René Levesque was the Premier of Quebec. He made it very clear that he would not sign anything that made Canada He's stronger. Separatist. Right. So he would not have supported anything. Mr. Trudeau realized that, made the deal that he could, uh, and therefore took it and left. He even joked, let's take this and run before any of you change your mind. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mulroney came to office thinking that had been a colossal mistake and that what needed to happen was to have that Quebec signature on the Constitution. And he was willing, therefore, to give the provinces what they wanted in order to get that that, uh, that signature. You think that was a mistake? I believe that was a mistake, and the Supreme Court of Canada believes that that was a mistake because the Supreme Court said that whether Quebec signs or not, they are tied to the Constitution, as are all of the people of Quebec, because they are Canadians. So therefore, obtaining Quebec signature was a symbolic act that was unnecessary to take. And I think that what Mr. Mulroney did with Meech Lake and what he did with the Charlottetown Accord that came later and went to referendum is divided the country, divided a number of different Canadians against other Canadians, uh, pitted a great number of Canadians against the people of Quebec, and I don't think that was a positive uh, move for the country. So I believe that him basically saying to Quebec, we will give you whatever you want, and all of the other provinces piled on and said, me too. And therefore, there was a great shift of power that was about to happen with Meech Lake and about to happen with Charlottetown that I think would have turned Sir John's vision on its head, and that would have been bad for the country. Having said that, we're now 35 years without Quebec's officially endorsing the most supreme law in the land, including the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, what you've articulated is the classic English-Canadian position, which is, okay, they didn't sign it, but they're covered. I mean, in Quebec, this is still a stain that won't go out. You would acknowledge that's had an impact on national unity as well. I would acknowledge that it's a stain, but I also stand by what the Supreme Court said in that it is a symbolic stain. Now, symbols matter, especially when we start talking about Quebec. Yes. Uh, perception matters more than the truth often in politics. So it is still a stain. But does that mean that uh, Mr. Mulroney is right when he said that Trudeau should have walked away and not accepted it when Quebec wouldn't sign? Well, then how long would we have been still in our constitutional adolescence, still having to go to Britain and saying, please, if you would, in, in our greatest Oliver Twist voice, could you please <laughs> change our constitution? Please, sir, I want some more. Exactly. <laughs> Where I think Mr. Trudeau did what a strong prime minister and a strong federal leader did and say, this is the best we can do. It's the art of the possible. Let's move on. Uh, you know I love your books, which is why you're here every time you write Thank one. You. But I am going to pick a bone with you here on one thing, because you did say, let's put this up. This is from uh, Sir John's Echo. In the 1992 Charlottetown referendum, virtually all the elites in the country agreed on the advisability of this decentralization pact and advocated for it. But average Canadians voted it down in firm fashion. The echo of Sir John still resonated. Do you think that's what people were really thinking when they turned thumbs down on Charlottetown? That was part of what they were thinking. And I think what I wrote was it is very difficult to read the person's mind when they go into a voting booth in some school gymnasium or, or church basement. Who knows what they are thinking and what factor 
uh, is the one that is making their mind up. I know what they were thinking. They one weren't of the, thinking that. One of the big factors, <laughs> and I mentioned in the book, is that Brian Mulroney's popularity was at such a low point exactly. that if he was for it, we're against it. But the point I make in the book is, even if that is the only reason that most of the people who voted against it did so, the effect was still the same. Uh, that is a fair point. But, uh, I mean, Mulroney's popularity was so in the tank right then, and Preston Manning just demonized the hell out of that agreement. And one suspects that had more to do with its failure than Canadians waking up one day and saying, I'm very concerned about the decentralizing effects of the Charlottetown Accord. Fair? But... Uh, fair to a point, but at the same point, one of the people who was also really effective in turning the, the corner, the popularity of the, of the Accord, the Charlottetown Accord, was high and rising until Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Trudeau made his speech in Montreal um, at the egg roll uh, nice. speeches became known egg roll. because of the restaurant <laughs> in which he said it. And the point that he made was exactly what Sir John would have said. This is decentralizing. I do not want Canada to be um, what Joe Clark had said, a community of communities. We must be united. He said that if this happens, he said the same thing as in, in 1971, when again Quebec stopped the Constitution from coming home with the Victoria deal. He said if this happens, then the federal government will simply be a tax collector to a confederation of shopping centers. Head waiter to the provinces. Exactly. And that's what he did not want. And the uh, the poll that was taken shortly after Trudeau's speech, which was all about decentralization and the evils of it, as he called it, the polls changed by 20 points the week afterwards. So while Preston Manning was vilifying Mulroney, and while many people were against it because Mulroney was for it, Trudeau was very clear in the decentralization that was going to happen, and people, therefore, I believe, we need to give them a little bit more credit that they were thinking about that too. Hmm. That guy on our jumbotron, his picture was in Stephen Harper's office when Stephen Harper was the prime minister of the country. It was. Did Stephen Harper hear Sir John's echo? No. Stephen Harper did a great number of things. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter whether you like or dislike Stephen Harper as a person. It doesn't matter whether you like his policy or dislike his policy. What he did when he came into office is essentially take the firewall letter that he had written to and, and others from Calgary. Just explain what that is. Take the reason. Okay. The, he had been a member of parliament. He resigned from the Reform Party. He became part of a group in Calgary known as the Calgary School. And he wrote a letter, and he and others wrote a letter to the Premier of Alberta at the time, Ralph Klein, in which he said that there needed to be a firewall built around Alberta because the federal government was too strong, too powerful, and therefore we needed in Alberta, he said, to essentially do everything we could to nearly secede from the union. We we're going to pull out of the health care. We're going to pull out of the pension plan. We're going to pull out of the RCMP. We're going to re rejig our taxes so that fewer of our tax dollars from Alberta go to the federal government and therefore to other provinces, have not provinces. Build that firewall around Alberta. When he became prime minister, and he was prime minister for nearly 10 years, if you think in terms of the firewall, you can see the policy decisions that he made were trying to reduce the power of the federal government, not just for Alberta, but for all. He, for example, told the provinces that they would get a 6% raise on their health care spending for the great deal, but there would be no strings attached. He killed Prime Minister Martin's health care, uh, um, daycare care. policy that um, was going to be the first new federal program in a couple of generations. All 10 provinces, all three territories degree. He axed it and sent $100 a month to families for their daycare, which covers a day or two a month. Mm -hmm. um, he cut the GST by 2%. He cut corporate tax and income tax. Uh, he, did, he cut the long-form census. He cut over 100 research projects and told scientists that they could no longer... And I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. Each one of these policies, if you take a look at the whole, was basically affecting the power and reach of the federal government. He was going to emasculate it, he was going to starve it, and he was going to lobotomize it. 
If he had been in power for another couple of terms, then what he would have done is basically taking Sir John's vision for the dominant power in the federal government and turned it exactly on its head. Now, I, I know you disagree with that, but it's a perfectly defensible position. Absolutely it is. Having said that, I wonder if you have come to any conclusions in your own mind about why Mr. Harper had such a fascination and admiration for Sir John A. Macdonald and yet didn't share his view of how Canada ought to operate at all. I think there is enough complexity in Sir John A. Macdonald that you can absolutely admire one part of the man and absolutely despise another part. I have written a couple of books in which Sir John plays a dominant role and I still am repulsed by his racism with respect to the Chinese navvies that worked on the railway and then he did everything he could to get rid of them and stop any more Chinese coming in. I absolutely despise his policies, the actions that he took with respect to Canada's indigenous people. Something, uh, crimes, I believe, that we are still paying the price for. And so I think there is enough in Sir John to admire and enough in Sir John that we are feel justifiably uncomfortable about mm -hmm. that Mr. Harper could have Sir John's uh, picture in his office and yet do everything he could to turn his vision mm -hmm. on its head. We are in a couple of minutes going to uh, invite a couple of other voices to join our discussion here. Uh, but I want to, just f to finish up our discussion here, uh, give the final word to a premier uh, who happens to share Sir John's echo. Mm. And uh, that premier's name is Bill Davis. And he said, quoted in your book, I am a Canadian who lives and works in Ontario. It is not the other way around. The whole of Canada is always greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, now, again, that's not a quote from a new book on Bill Davis. That is a quote from your book yes. on Sir John A. How rare is that view among premiers in your experience? I believe that it is not as rare as we would expect. I believe that premiers, as I said, are patriots. And like Bill Davis, a man that I know that you admire and have written very well about, I, I, I admire your book on that, which I, I, I didn't read. raise this for that reason. Well, I, 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 I realize I, that. I maybe raised it for that reason. <laughs> okay. I realize that, and I read your book in order to do, as part of the research for this one. But I believe that, as I said, that all premiers are patriots. But Bill Davis was like all premiers that fight tooth and nail for what is best for their province. And there was no greater scrapper for what was best for Ontario than Bill Davis. And he disagreed with Prime Minister Trudeau famously on a great many issues. But not the Constitution. But he saw the Constitution as more important than whatever was going on in Ontario at that point. And therefore him and Premier Hatfield from New Brunswick were the two that supported Trudeau and said that quote was taken uh, from 1971 after the failure of the Victoria um, mm -hmm. deal that almost brought the Constitution home. And he said there are times when the Prime Minister must speak for Canada. There are times when he must decide. Mm -hmm. And it was Bill Davis that was essential for the success in 1982 of bringing the Constitution home. And so therefore I think we can see that there are times when Premiers believe, even though they sometimes can't be found to be saying it, that the Prime Minister must be the voice of Canada. They do hear Sir John's echo. They do indeed. They do. John Boyko, thanks so much for this. Stand by. We're going to continue our conversation in just a moment. Look forward to it. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.